Today we are loving the natural way. Love has always been a subject that's been difficult for me to talk about until I began to think of uh, the way I do talk about it, and that's that it's an activity that draws to us that which is for our highest good and dissolves that which is not. And of course that does not describe what love is. It describes what I believe the activity of love is. But it's not, uh, doesn't touch on our emotions, it's a head explanation, which I think we need, we need both these things. But it's uh, one of the things Jesus pointed out is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second like unto it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And of course he's not coming up with anything, anything original, this is uh, out of the Old Testament. But he's just reminding people of what he calls the, basically the foundation of his ministry. And it's, it's an important thing for us to look at and think about from where he's coming from. As you know, I have been very interested in near-death research, and one of the things that bothers me about it that some of the researchers say these are not people that have necessarily had an experience of their own. They have interviewed hundreds or thousands of people, others who have. But they, they try to explain what is our purpose here based on the information that we're gathering from these, these people. And there are several of them that say that they believe that our purpose here is to learn to love. And that sounds pretty noble. But when you hear a person who has had a near-death experience try to describe their encounter with unconditional love, they can't describe it. They can't put it into words. They didn't learn how to do it. They were thrown in. They saw how it works. So I, do not, I don't think that we are here to learn how to do this. But we are here to open ourselves to that presence of God as love. And the, the thing that we do not have to do to do that is have a near-death experience. And that's, again, what some of the researchers are saying. The way that we the average person can experience that level of love is through a time of meditation or times of meditation of developing the ability to let go of all of our preconceptions and this would be the first part of what Jesus is saying here reminding his listener that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart mind and soul and the emphasis here should be your your God have your experience. See, what changes these people is not reading about other people's experience, it's they have found their experience. They've had their experience. They've been thrown into the ocean of love, and they have experienced it firsthand. Somebody can say, you know, you have to learn to appreciate and respect electricity. And so you flip a light switch and you say, I appreciate that, I, I do. And I, you turn your oven on, I appreciate the, the electric oven. and Cook something in the microwave. You know, you can have an appreciation and a respect for that energy. But you really have a respect for that energy when you grab a bare wire. You learn what it is. You learn from direct experience what this power is, what this energy is. And so the next person that says you have to learn to respect electricity, <laughs> you hear it differently. You do respect it. I remember grabbing one as a kid. We had uh, those kind, old-fashioned kind that hung, a light bulb would hang from a chain. 
with a wire running through it, you know, and uh, the cover on that thing was off and the light bulb was off, so I reached up and grabbed the two screws, you know, that, that the, uh, to, to change the bulb. It changed my bulb. It, <laughs> it was, a, it just it gives you a whole new understanding of what this stuff is, you know. And I think that's what these people are experiencing. They have, they've grabbed the live wires and they say, now I understand, I can't explain it. I can't explain electricity, what it feels like. I can say it hurts like heck, <laughs> but I can't explain what it is. You'll know it when you, I'll say you'll know it when you experience it. And we all have, I'm sure, had those, had some kind of a shock in our life. But it, uh, and, and you know, that makes you understand why shock treatment maybe might have worked because you'll, you'll confess anything if somebody gives you th that stuff. No, I'm being facetious. That's a horrible thing to say. But um, there's a difference in direct experience. When we try to describe something like that, we don't really have the words for it. We can say it hurts or we can say it fe felt like my muscles clamped up and I couldn't let go. And it, you know, I mean, any description that we come up with is not the same as having the experience. And I don't particularly want to have it again. So when we say that we are to love the Lord our God, that's like uh, the sign that points in the direction that we're to go, but it's not the direction. It's not the activity. To love the Lord your God means that you are to discover your Lord, your God. Not to read about it, but to actually discover and experience, to grab the live wire of God and have a firsthand experience. Because I do not think that the second commandment is possible if we don't do it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I've said before that you can only love your neighbor to the degree that you do love yourself. And many of us don't. Many of us consider ourselves inadequate, inadequate incomplete. We're always trying to do something to make ourselves better, to be more loving. We're trying to practice love. But what I feel about these uh, near-death stories, when people try to describe love, they're not inventing anything. They're walking through a door, and there it is. They're not trying to plug into it. It's like it just happens, because that's the nature of reality. It's absolute love. But the words that we try to use to define it and describe it, the cards we send and all of the things that we try to say, when we say we love someone, most of what we're saying is, is that we love conditionally. I love you because of who you are, but I don't particularly care for that person. It's like if you grab the electricity, it applies to all things, not just some. It is what it is, in other words. It's its own nature. So the first part of this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, or heart, soul, and mind, is to say, seek to have a direct experience. Because you can't love God unless you experience God. You, you will exercise a concept. And that's what much of religion is based on. It's also based on emotion, and love is not emotion. It stirs emotion, just like electricity stirs emotion. But it's not emotion. Love is not an emotion, it's a power. It's a fundamental power that we are all, that creates us. It's part of our very being. And so we're not trying to be loving. We're not trying to do our best to love as we understand it. To love the Lord your God is to seek a direct experience with that and let it show you what it is. So that's a big difference. You can't study it and get it. It's all about experience. We've demonstrated that we cannot legislate love and accept 
and acceptance of others religiously or socially. And look how hard we are trying to do that. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. We have to look at everybody's weakness and create laws around protecting all of that. And it's not working. It creates resentment. It's not working. But we don't get that. We think that love can be legislated. We think that a liking for another person, if we're not allowed to say certain words, that that's showing kind of some kind of respect, does that change what goes on in your mind? No, it doesn't. It doesn't change what goes on in our consciousness. We just don't do it because we don't want to get arrested. And there's a big difference in doing something because you know why and doing it because you're afraid of the consequences. So love is not something you do, it is something you are. If you try to love someone, you don't really love them. You apply a concept or technique to them. If you try to love an enemy, you will wind up suppressing what you really feel. Now this is not to say that what you really feel is a good thing and that you need to hang on to that. But we're told to, you know, that's the, the Christian message, love your enemy, love, uh, pray for those who persecute you and all that. And so we go through those motions, but when you think about what's really going on in your mind as you're going through these motions, are you changing? Or are you just agreeing to comply with what's supposed, supposed to be done? And I'm not asking this in a judgmental way. I'm saying let's all look at how we're doing this. Look at what we think this is. Is that loving the natural way? Or am I trying to apply something that I've learned? I'm supposed to love my neighbor, so I will act as if I do. But don't ask me what I really think of that DI. And that's what determines the quality of your life. It's not what you do, it's what you feel and what is going on inside. And that's one thing that these people say also when they have these life reviews. And I'm not looking forward to this, frankly. Where they become aware of every thought and feeling they ever had. And not only that, but the impact those thoughts, feelings, actions have had on other people. And they relive that in just a matter of seconds. I can't figure out how. Nobody can figure out how that would work. Time and space are, mean nothing. Suddenly the whole life is played out. It's sort of like the Egyptian um, the Book of the Dead, you know, where the, you die and your heart is put on a scale and a feather is put on the other side. And if, if your heart outweighs the feather, you're in trouble. <laughs> I choose not to believe that. So. <laughs> but it's, it's an idea, you know, how honest are we with ourselves? You know, how honest are we in, in, uh, with these principles that we're looking at? But you cannot try to love an enemy. It's not the same thing. If you were dropped into a, a well, a cistern, say, like we talked about last week, where you're surrounded totally with and somebody puts you there and you resent them for doing that because it's taken away your freedom you can't see much of anything you're going to have a certain attitude while you're there in that uh, captive state but if you get out if you're lifted out and that little world is no longer your problem you will naturally think of other people differently, even the ones that put you there. Maybe you'll understand why they did it. It's like the person that pulled out in front of you seemed to be so mindless. Maybe they were headed to the ER. Maybe they had a pregnant woman in the back seat having a baby. <laughs> Who knows? But at the moment that that happens, suddenly you're down in this, in this small little world. And you might have a reaction and you say, well, I'm not supposed to be doing that. I'm supposed to learn how to love my neighbor, you know, even in a situation like that. When you're lifted out of that 
situation, it's, it's much easier, it's much more natural because you're not bound by that, by that trap, that trapped place. And that's what I think happens when somebody has one of these experiences and their mind is so open, they don't condemn anybody because it's all too small. It's small stuff. It becomes small stuff because they are much larger. And maybe that's a better way to think of it. Love is becoming larger than whatever it is you're looking at. Love becomes larger than, makes you larger than the problem you have with that person. It allows you to see broader, that you're more. That maybe you're angry at them because you're protecting some weakness in yourself. Well, maybe if you don't have that weakness, you're not angry anymore. So that's how we look at it. That's how we begin to look at it. But love takes us to that place. It's not a thing that you can learn how to do. You might catch yourself because, you know, you've gone, we've all got, gone down the anger road where it shuts everything down and it's a miserable situation. The person that suffers most is the one who's expressing it. And we say, do I want that or do I want to be free? And we can stop ourselves from going down that kind of thing. But that's more of a technique. If you're totally immersed in it, it erases your limitations. And the reason we get angry with people, the reason we get don't like them so well is because they're threatening some weakness of ours in some way. Well, what if you don't have a weakness? What if you don't have a weakness to threaten? Then you won't have the same response. So love erases your weaknesses. That's kind of the bottom line, dissolves that which is not for your highest good. It's not something you learn how to do, you let it do it for you, you let it happen in you. The best way to approach this problem of loving our enemies is stop trying to do it, simply expose ourselves to the source of love within our being. To bask in that eternal current of inner light that shines regardless of what kinds of attitudes we hold. That's why I have said many times that you can never really mess up your relationship with God. You can't do it. We may think we can because we think of love in a certain way. If I do this, I'm going to anger God because I've been taught that. But you don't change the nature of love. And that's part of why we have our negative reactions, again, because we're coming out of a place in ourselves that's incomplete. We're seeing ourselves in a way that God doesn't see us. I don't deserve the blessings from God because I've done bad things. God doesn't think that way. God cannot think that way, as Meister Eckert, Eckert said. I never thank God for loving me because he can't help himself. That's the nature of love. It's the nature of God. And so tr and rather than try to uh, just, this problem of loving our enemies is to stop trying to do it, simply expose ourselves. Okay, we stop trying to apply a technique. And we say, what is this energy? What is this life that is love? And I love what Emily Katie has to say about it. She says, we want a revelation of God as love within us so that our whole being will be filled and thrilled with love, a love that will not have to be pumped up by a determined effort because we know that it is right to love and wrong not to love, but a love that will flow with the spontaneity and fullness of an artesian well because it is so full at the bottom that it must flow out. And to me, that's one of the best descriptions I've ever read about. Because we're, we always are trying to be loving and we try to love. She's saying, that's, we want more than that. We want this to be a natural, a spontaneous thing. And the only way that can happen is that we get past our personality. In our times of quiet, we let go and we expose ourselves to that deeper level. She knew exactly what she was talking about. Divine love is an energy that, like the sun or rain or flower or the song of a bird, gives itself unconditionally. 
When we experience enough of this source to fall in love with it, we will naturally behave just as it does. Not because we are told to, but because we can't help ourselves. I took this photograph last uh, Friday over at Matcha Park, and um, the reason, one of the reasons I love going out and doing this and trying to capture is they give so freely. It's just there, and it's giving all the time. And it's saying, if you want a photo of me, take it. You're not going to steal my soul. Show it to the world. And that's, that's the nature of love. It is, presents its very best. And we can photograph it. Or we can just sit and enjoy it. It's a, um, it's a giving. And when I am out among wildlife, and I know you know what I'm talking about, there is an acceptance there. Just a complete acceptance. It's not that birds won't fly away. I mean, they do that for their, for their own good. It's wise that they do. Darwin was talking about Galapagos. You know, the birds would not fly away. They land on your coffee cup. And he called them stupid because they could get themselves killed and often did because they did not have this natural fear. So what he's saying is they just don't know the human heart. You know, they don't know the human being, how dangerous we are. But it's a good thing that they're skittish. You know, we have quail in the backyard and we have a feral cat running around back there and these quail are very skittish and I'm glad they are because that cat is a dangerous hunter. <laughs> Does loving someone mean we have to, or we must embrace their unacceptable behavior? Of course not. It means that we deal with their behavior from a loving point of view. That's a big difference. And that loving point of view is what weaknesses in me need to be erased? Am I willing to let go? Why am I reacting this way? What do I fear that I will lose if I, if I let down my guard or whatever? And again, this is personal inventory that we all have to, to look at if uh, we decide what kind of experience we want to have. If somebody's making us miserable right now, we start with the idea that I'm actually making myself miserable. And I don't like to say that. I don't like the sound of that because that means I've got to do something. <laughs> it's not them, it's me. But then I think, well, that empowers me. That gives me, puts me in the place I want to be. Why should I let them make me miserable when in truth or not, I'm making myself miserable, and I can do something about that. And what's interesting about that, if you rise above your, the misery you think they're, that they are causing, you render them powerless. Not in a negative way, but you get yourself out of that cistern, so your world becomes bigger all of a sudden. It means that we deal with their behavior from a loving point of view. Love sometimes binds, sometimes dissolves, sometimes we embrace people, sometimes we let them go, and that's true. Sometimes we'll draw people, sometimes we kick them out of our life as a result of what we come to realize. And that's not necessarily a negative thing. And it's not necessarily protecting a weakness, it's letting love do its perfect work. It shows them the door, you know, it has a way of doing that when the door needs to be shown. As we stay centered in love, which is not easy to do, I guess you probably have gathered that, we're guided to do the right thing and do it from the highest point of view. Our actions will in some way serve to bless all involved. Okay, so it's a very high standard that I've laid out here, but it's a very accessible standard. It's one that I work with all the time and I succeed once in a while. But I understand how it works. I understand that if I'm miserable because of somebody else's actions, it's my interpretation that's causing the misery. And there's a lot of power in that. All right. Thank you for coming out. Have a happy Valentine's Day and hope you do something fun today. Thanks for coming.
Watching a talk given by Reverend Doug Bottorf here at Independent Unity in beautiful Grand Junction, Colorado. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. It really helps us spread our message. If you would like to support us, you can do so by clicking the button in the right hand corner of the video screen. We greatly appreciate your support. Thanks again for watching. <laughs>